Before I start the sermon tonight, I just want to make a confession of a fault of mine. Uh, I had preached a sermon in December called The Son of God, where I had actually, and it was about a 45 minute sermon, where I had gone back and I had listened to it, someone had pointed this out to me, where I had made some statements that I no longer agree with, that I think were wrong, they were false, they were not something that I should have said, and I just want to confess that. I want to say, look, I did teach something wrong, that's not what I was trying to teach in that moment, and I'm going to read for you uh, something that I had said in that sermon, and then I'm going to preach against that thought. I'm going to preach against that. I figured, might as well correct it. Might as well correct the error that I made. You know, the last thing I want to do is get up and preach something wrong or false that would maybe lead somebody astray or maybe affect them negatively. That's the last thing I want to do. Right. I don't want to do that ever. I want to make sure everything I say is correct with the Bible. And you know, you say, well, you know, you made this mistake. Yeah, some people grow and some people don't. Okay? Let's, uh, but I was talking about Jesus Christ and I said, and there's a verse that says, He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And in that context, I said, either you have to believe that Jesus Christ is at the top and God the Father is below, or they're the same person. But they can't be different. You can't say that verse is true and then say that Jesus isn't God or say that He's not the Father. Now, in my zeal to preach that sermon against the Mormons, against the Muslims, I was trying to prove the deity of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, I did teach there in that moment or in that thought or in this, this few lines that I read, I was trying to say that they were the same person. And that's, that's a horrible way to explain the Trinity. I think that's false, and I'm going to preach against that viewpoint tonight. But go to 1 Corinthians 15 if you would. Now, just to make it clear... I've never believed anything contrary to the Trinity on in a, any conscious level at all. I may have said things that were false, or I may have said things that were wrong, or explained the Trinity in my own, you know, fleshly mind that was wrong, but I've never consciously ever thought anything wrong about the Trinity. I grew up in a church called Trinity Fellowship Church, where they had a play, where they literally every year they had three guys that would stand at the top of the balcony being God. And I thought, hey, it's three persons. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I've never had a problem with the Trinity. Now, a few years ago, whenever I was really trying to tie down my doctrine, I wasn't really sure on the word person. I was like, well, I don't know if there's a super clear verse there back in that time. I didn't know exactly if I thought that was right. But this is what I said about Jesus. I said, Jesus is the Word of God and the Son of God. He, along with the Father and the Holy Ghost, make up God. Now, that's not anything contrary to the Trinity. I've always believed in the Trinity. And I think in the last few months I've probably grown a lot in what I believe about the Trinity. Or maybe I'll be able to explain it a lot better. But look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. I'm going to prove to you that what I had said was false. It says in verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the first roots, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which should put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now this verse is super clear, that even within the Godhead, Jesus Christ is subject unto the Father. Now, in the context of what I was teaching, I was trying to say, look, obviously Jesus is the King of Kings, proving He's God, and we know there's nobody above God. But within the Godhead, we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Ghost, and we see the, the Son is subject to the Father. And we know the Holy Ghost doesn't speak of Himself, so we can see some, some level of subjection for this Holy Ghost here. But the Bible's crystal clear that there's three people, that there's three persons of the Godhead. Now, there's been some people kicked out of our church for believing what's called oneness Pentecostalism. And now, they don't like that term. They try to say they don't agree with that term. But I'll just read for you the definition of oneness Pentecostalism from on Wikipedia. It says, this is what oneness Pentecostalism believes. And we'll see what it says. It says, oneness Pentecostalism derives its distinctive name from its teaching on the Godhead, which is popularly referred to as the oneness doctrine. This doctrine states that there is one God, a singular divine spirit, who manifests himself in many ways, including as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. This stands in sharp contrast to the doctrine of three distinct and eternal persons posited by Trinitarian theology. Oneness is similar to 
Sabellianism, also referred to as modalism, modalistic monarchism, modalism, or modal mar mar monarchism, patrapashanism, oneness believers baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, commonly referred to as Jesus named baptism, rather than using the Trinitarian formula. So basically at the high level, oneness makes it distinctive by saying there's only one person who just manifests as three Manifest as a father, manifest as a man, manifest as a, as a spirit. And the only name for God is Jesus. There's one God, and his name's just Jesus. That's the only two distinctives. Now, within oneness, there's going to be a lot of variation, right? I mean, if you go to a Baptist church down the street, they probably don't believe the exact same as we do. That doesn't just automatically make them not Baptist. There's going to be a lot of variation. But the, the, the distinctive of oneness Pentecostalism, they don't believe that there are three that are one. They believe there's one that pretends to be three. Right, right. They pretend to be three. And then they say, well, we're going to baptize in Jesus' name. That's what these guys said. I mean, you can't get it any clearer. They all said that. They all believe that. That's why you can say they're oneness. That's why you can call them oneness Pentecostal. Not because of, you know, all the strange beliefs of the Pentecostal, but because of what it clearly teaches and even the unsaved person that wrote this article says it stands in sharp contrast to the doctrine of the Trinity. I mean, this guy even understands that it's different. Yeah, yeah. But go to 1 John 5. They literally flip 1 John 5 on its head. They teach the exact opposite of what it's teaching. <clears throat> the Bible says in 1 John 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now what does the oneness teach? Oneness teaches there is one who pretends to be three. They have it backwards. The gospel, the Bible, the Trinity is three that are one. Amen. Oneness teaches that there's one who pretends to be three. So what does it mean to be a pretender? That's the name of my sermon, the pretender. That's the God of oneness. The God of oneness is not the God of the Bible. He's a pretender. What does it mean to pretend? It means to speak and act so as to make it appear that something is the case when in fact it is not. Or another definition is not really what is represented as being used in a game or deception. Now when you look at the word pretend, there's a lot of synonyms like imagination, make-believe, made-up, fantasy, dreamed-up, unreal, fictitious, mythical, feigned, fake, mock, sham, simulated, artificial, false, phony, that's what the God of oneness is. If you actually believe what they believe about the God, if they think that God is this oneness God, they believe he's a fake. They believe he's a phony. They believe he's just pretending. The Bible makes clear that the Trinity and the Bible teach that there are three people who collectively make one God. That's what it means to be one. There's one God that's composed of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three make one God. Now I have an object lesson for you tonight. Right. Just to help those people that really need some uh, extra help. Now in this box tonight, I have a cake. You can see it very clearly, can't you? Now, who in this room is going to say this is more than one cake? This is like two cakes or three or a hundred. It's one cake, obviously, is it not? Now what if I said this is a tri-layer cake? Now you've never seen it, right? You've never seen inside it. But now you're kind of wondering, well, is it one cake or what's going on? Well, you have to cut inside it to really see what it is, right? I'm in a position that this cake is like the Trinity in the Old Testament. You can't really, it's the Old Testament's not focusing on the fact that there's three. It's focusing on there's one. There's one God. There's one Lord. That makes it super clear. But when you get into the New Testament, it shifts, doesn't it? It shifts. You get to see on the inside. And so I have a piece of the cake here. Maybe you can kind of see it. There's three layers of that cake. Now, in order to make a cake of this size, this is how the people do it. I'm going to teach you some baking, okay? <laughs> this is what the baker does. He gets all the ingredients, and he puts it in a bowl, and he mixes it all together. He makes the batter, okay? Now, he pours it into pans. He pours it into three separate pans, but he gives the exact same amount. They're all the exact same quantity. And then when they rise, they make these thin layers of cake. Now, they're all cake. If you just looked at one, you say, this is cake. You look at another one, it's cake. If you've seen one cake, you've seen the other cake. They're the exact same. But then they layer them together, and they put icing over it, and you have what? One cake. You have three that are one. 
Now you say, well, how is that different than what oneness teaches? Well, oneness, again, you go back to this illustration. If you could hypothetically, which you can't, but if you made a cake of one layer, okay, it's not three layers, it's one layer this tall, and you put icing on it, you couldn't tell the difference from the outside. And imagine there was no icing and you just saw all the layers, but actually it was just the one cake. So in order to make it look like this one, they just dent out the edge around the corner and they just pour a little icing around the edge, okay? So from the outside, it looks the same. It looks like it's a three-layer cake. But then when you cut inside of it, there's not any layers. It's just one. That's the God of oneness. He pretends to be a tri-layer cake when he's not. He's deceiving people. He's lying to people. And you know, the same thing with that type of a cake. It's interesting, I asked the baker, I said, could you make this cake? And she's like, no. I said, well, hypothetically, you make it so it doesn't have custard, it doesn't have, light, it doesn't have layers. I said, well, hypothetically, you've got a pan this big, could you make it? And she says, no, because in order to cook the middle of that cake, you'd have to burn all the edges. Or, if you had the outside cooked the right way, the inside would be undercooked, it'd be half-baked. Just like the stupid <laughs> oneness doctrine is half-baked. Now, you can look at the outside, you can look at the edges, and you can say, oh, it looks good. But then you cut open the middle, and the whole Bible's destroyed. The whole Bible's destroyed with the oneness lie, with this false, heretical view. It's from Satan. Because right. Satan's the pretender. Why did it really? Revelation 13? Because it talks about the Antichrist. Yep. Now, who's the Antichrist? He's one that's pretending to be the Christ. That's what Satan is. Satan's a deceiver. Satan's a pretender. The God of the Bible is not a pretender. The God of the Bible is not a deceiver. The God of the Bible is true and holy and righteous. So let's look at some places where the Bible describes what a pretender would be like. Because that word's not necessarily in the Bible. You know, the word Trinity's not in the Bible either, but we still see it taught. Go to uh, Proverbs 6, if you would. Proverbs 6. The Bible says in Leviticus 19, verse 11, Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. God hates lying. But if you know oneness is true, then it's all a lie. And all the New Testament talking about this Father and this Son and this Holy Ghost, it's just a facade. It's just a pretend. It's just a game. It's just God playing house with Himself. It's ridiculous. Go to Pro I'll read for you from Proverbs 12. Did y'all turn to Proverbs 6? Look at Proverbs 6, verse 6. Let's look there. 16. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto them. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among his brethren. You know what these guys have done after they spread all their lies? They're trying to sow discord among the brethren. Trying to divide people. Trying to say, oh, is that exactly what you believe? You believe contrary to Pastor Anderson. And they rail on Pastor Anderson. And they speak evil of the man of God. And they're trying to draw people away from the church. That's wicked. God hates it. Look in the mirror. Proverbs 12, it says, He that speaketh truth speaketh forth righteousness. But a false witness deceit. Go to 2 Peter 2 if you would. Proverbs 14, 5 says, A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. 2 Corinthians 11 says about talking about uh, another Jesus in the context of 2 Corinthians 11. I'll read for you. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now think about this, okay? It's talking about Satan. He transforms himself into another form. He's pretending to be something he's not. Just like the oneness God just pretends to be a son, or pretends to be the Holy Ghost, or pretends to be all these things. That's not the God of the Bible. That's Satan. That's his ministers. Those that are transforming themselves into something they're not, and lying and deceiving. That's, that's, that's the God of the oneness, is Satan. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Go to uh, Revelation chapter 12. So we see that the false prophets, they use feigned words. We see all the wicked, godless, reprobate, evil people in the Bible. They're doing what? They're lying, they're deceiving, they're speaking all kinds of false uh, visions, false kind of prophecies. 
Why? That's the opposite of God. God's making a contrast. I'm not a deceiver. I'm not a liar. I'm not the Antichrist. No, I'm the Christ. That's a very clear distinction between God and Satan. In 2 Corinthians 4, I'll read for you, it says, And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Look, Satan's trying to blind people. He's trying to confuse them. He's trying to trick them. He's trying to deceive them. That's not the God of the Bible. Matthew 24, verse 5, it says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. What's the point of the Antichrist? To deceive people who Christ is. That's not the God of the Bible. Christ was coming to preach that He is the Christ, that He is the Son of God. He was. How many times is Christ trying to say, I'm the Son of God? Trying to get people to believe on the Son of God. And you're going to tell me it was a lie? He was pretending? He's deceiving people? He's not really the Son of God? He's somebody else? You're just destroying the Bible. Revelation 12, look at verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now think about this. Satan has deceived the whole world. Now before 1913, nobody believed this oneness junk. No one. So you have to believe that for thousands of years, nobody understood the nature of God. Everyone was deceived. If that's true, I mean, the Mormons have a longer history than this doctrine. And guess what? It's false, too. We know that God's not, the, the nature of God is just unknown to men until 1913, and a bunch of unsaved, wicked tongue talkers are the ones that figure it out. I mean, give me a break. Everything that came out of Azusa Street is straight out of hell. They teach all kinds of false doctrine, a false salvation. They speak all kinds of gibberish and wicked, satanic stuff. People are being demon possessed. Oh, but they figured out the nature of God. They figured out that God's just one God. Ridiculous. That's when you start needing to questioning, hey, is what I'm believing false? That's a real good indication. But we always have to go to the Bible. And the Bible says, let uh, God be true and every man a liar. Of course, we've got to get all of our truth from this word, but God made it clear that he's going to preserve his word. And you're not special. You're not going to come up with something that no one has ever come up with, ever. It's a brand new doctrine. And if some false prophet's the one that really originated it, you better be really suspect. Go to Revelation 13 where we have where we read. I'll read for you a couple other places. Matthew 24 says, And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Revelation 20 says, And shall go out and deceive the nations, talking about Satan, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number of whom is this of the sand of the sea? John chapter 8. The Bible reads as Jesus speaking, Year of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. All lies are of Satan, none of God. God's never going to lie to you. God can't lie. Titus 1 2 says that very clear. We should never think that anything that God's doing is false, is deceitful, he's trying to deceive us. Now, the Bible does say that God gives strong delusion unto the wicked, unto the reprobate. It talks about Him blinding the eyes of the Pharisees, those that have rejected Jesus Christ, those that have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. But God's not going to deceive you. God's will, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. God's not a deceiver. He's not a liar. And I think any time that people are getting, you know, uh, some kind of delusion or some kind of, of wicked spirit. It's just the fact that Satan and his angels are constantly trying to harm everyone. And eventually when someone gives up on God, he just gives up on them. Meaning what? Then all the demons and all the God of this world comes and blinds them. It's not like God, I don't know that he's directly blinding them. I could be wrong there, but I think it's just through the power of you know, Satan or the power that he gives unto these you know, dark evil forces to go out and deceive the world and kill and steal and do all these wicked things. Just like we see uh, with Job. Satan was the one that actually, you know, performed all these wicked acts on Job. God just allowed him to do it, right? But look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. 
and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live, and he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now I'm not going to go through all the verses, but we know this is the ultimate deception. The ultimate deception is in the end times when the Antichrist comes and he's, he's causing everybody to take this mark and then he's killed with a deadly wound. And then the Bible says that Satan inhabits his body. Satan is pretending to be the Antichrist. He's not really that guy. He just indwells his body and then transforms himself into the Antichrist and has people worship him and call him God. That's a pretender. That's what they believe God of Witnesses. They believe the Father was just pretending to be the Son. Just pretending to be Christ. No, that's Satan. That's not the God of the Bible. Go to uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We see that God is truth. He's the light. He's holy. The Bible says in Psalms 31.5, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. John 14.6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the truth. He's not going around tricking people. He's not going around deceiving people. He literally is truth. I mean, oh, I'm, oh, I'm just lying. I'm not really the Son. I'm just pretending to be the Son. I'm really just the Father. That's ridiculous. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now these heretics will say, well, the Word existed in the beginning, but not Jesus. Yeah, it's just me and my words standing up here. It's just me and my words talking to each other. That doesn't make any sense. That's ridiculous. Keep reading. It says in verse 2, The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Look at verse 4. And Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Now you stop there, you say, well, it's saying that there was light with him, right? So is it literally just talking about light? Or was it talking about a person? Well, look at the end of verse 7. It says that all men through him might believe. What is he talking about? A person. The light's not just light. It's a person. Because look at verse 8. He was not that light. Now what a ridiculous statement to say John the Baptist was not physical light. It was obvious that light was referring to a person, and he's contrasting, saying, I'm not the light, Jesus Christ is the light. Just like the Word of God is Jesus Christ. It's not these just mystical words floating around that's not really the Son, that's not really God. No, Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. Him. He's the light. He's the Word. He's the truth. Of course. But Jesus Christ was there from the beginning. Obviously, we know that His name's the Word of God. That doesn't mean that He wasn't there with God the Father in the beginning. They want to say, oh, He was begotten later. Oh, He didn't really come into existence until the Father became the Son later. That's a lie straight out of hell. Go to uh, Revelation 4. Revelation 4, if you would. 1 Corinthians 3 says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are. God is truth. God is light. God is holy. And thanks to Jesse, I understand this verse a little bit better. Let's look at verse 8. It says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. Now why in the world do he say three holies there? Well, what if there was three gods? Or not, sorry, false. What if there's three persons that make up one God standing there and he says, holy, holy, holy. That makes perfect sense of the Trinitarian view. Right. But what about the oneness view? Now, the oneness view, they don't know what to think about the end times. They're confused if there's just like one person or if there's the person with the lamb up there. They have no idea where the Holy Ghost fits into any of it. I mean, they just have no idea what's going on. But it doesn't make any sense because it's clear that there's two people in heaven by the fact that all the mention of Jesus Christ being at the right hand of the Father talks about the Lamb being in the midst of the throne and the worshiping the Lamb and the Father. Well, if there's really only one, but we see multiple in heaven, whether you want to call it manifestations or persons, I believe it's persons, obviously, okay? But isn't that a pretend? I mean, isn't it a fake? If there's two, but there's really only one, 
It's like he's lying to us. Right. And why in the world is he saying holy multiple times? Doesn't make any sense. That was just an introduction to the sermon. I have three points tonight. Go to Genesis chapter 22. So I just want to make it clear, though. What's, what was the point of all that? What was the point? The point is this. God is not a liar. God is not a deceiver. God's not trying to trick you. God's not trying to, to pretend to be something that he's not. He's secure in who he is. Did you, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he's secure that he's the God of the world. He's the Lord of lords. He's the King of kings. I'm pretty sure the Son of God is secure in who he is. He's not trying to masquerade himself as something else. Like Satan is, though. Satan's the deceiver, he's false, he's a liar, he's the father of liars, he's the father of everybody that's a liar. And guess what? All of his ministers are transformed into ministers of light, angels of light, trans trying to pretend to be something that they're really not. We see the stories of the Bible. We talk about the middle of the cake, okay? We look at some of the perimeter, we're looking at some of the outside verses. But the middle of the cake is uncooked with this oneness doctrine. It just destroys all the clear pictures of the Bible. It clears all the meaning of the Bible. It just destroys it. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. So now we're going to get this story about Abraham. And my first point is oneness doctrine destroys the Father and Son of God. It destroys that picture. It destroys that picture throughout the whole Bible. Look at verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Now what a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of the Father commanding the Son to come with them to the offering. And what? The Son's obedience to follow the, the, the Father's commandment. I mean, Isaac could have been like, hey, there's no lamb here. I'm going to skedaddle. Like, I'm getting out of here. I'm not going to carry this wood up to my own death. But we see Isaac was complacent. He was, he was uh, satisfied to fo follow the Father's commandment. A picture of Jesus Christ. Now, if the God of oneness is true, he's just pretending to be a son. He's just pretending to be a father. And he's really, oh, I'm commanding you to come, and it's really me, and we're just, I'm going up there. It's not really a father and son picture. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 10. And Abraham stretched forth, I'm sorry, look at verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now it's different to kill yourself than to kill your son. Every parent knows that. Every parent understands the sacrifice if you have one child to put them on the altar and to kill your one child. That's a horrible, awful thing to think about. But you know what? If the God of oneness is true, that's a lie. Because he wasn't really the son. He's just killing himself. What a lie. What a just a fraud. Just destroying the clear picture of the God of the Bible. The whole theme of the Bible. What's the most famous verse in the Bible? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish in everlasting life. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ being offered on the altar, being on the cross, being given by the Father as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. To Him give all the prophets witness that through His name, whosoever believeth in Him should receive remission of sins. It's all about Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the altar. What of a father sacrificing his son? Not of someone killing themselves. Not of someone pretending to be a son and pretending to be a father and just playing this stupid charade and this stupid game and lying about the whole Bible. Just destroys everything about the Bible. You cut open the cake and it's just a mess. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. It destroys every thought that a young child has. Every child reads this story and understands it. Every child sees, wow. The dad really killed the son? Oh no, it's just a lie. He just killed himself. What a fraud. Go to uh, Hebrews 11, if you would. 
The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how that she sorry, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God didn't spare his son. Didn't say he didn't spare himself. We didn't see Abraham the one. He went up with the wood and he put himself on the altar. And he took the he took the knife and he's like, oh, I'm gonna kill myself. That's the picture of the oneness God. Or it's like this. How many have seen, there's like these musicians, and they'll paint like half of their body like a man, and they'll paint the other half like a woman. And then they'll, can't, they'll come and sing on stage, and they'll just show you like one half of their body, and they'll sing the song like the male voice, and then the next part will be a, sing, a female, and they'll sing like a female. What a weird, bizarre thing. I mean, it's wicked. It's wicked for a man to dress up like a woman and pretend to be two people. But that's what the God of oneness is. He's just pretending. Oh, I'm the, I'm the father. Oh, but I'm also the son. Oh, I'm just talking to myself. I'm just pretending. That's your God. My God's a God of three persons. A father, a son, and a Holy Ghost. And God did not spare his own son. He didn't spare himself. So that is such a lie. Hebrews 11, look at verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac that he had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Figure, what's that mean? It's a picture. It's a picture of what God would do, of him giving his son. Oh, but it's a lie. It's a facade. It's pretend. It's fake. Go to uh, John 3 if you would. I'll read for you from Luke chapter 20. And it gave, Jesus gave a parable. He was talking about sending his servants unto these wicked husbandmen, and they were killing the servants and beating the servants. And he says, <clears throat> and again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be well, they will reverence him when they see him. What did, the, what did the husbandman do? He didn't send himself. He sent Jesus Christ. He sent the son. That's a parable of God the Father sending his son. Not sending himself. John chapter 3, look at verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So who came down from heaven? He did. Who's he? The Son of Man. It wasn't, obviously, Jesus Christ is the Word of God. I'm not taking away from that. But He's also the Son of Man in heaven who came down and took upon Him the form of a certain. He took upon a body of flesh, a body of sin. The Bible says in verse 14, As Moses lived up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lived up. Obviously talking about Jesus Christ. Look at verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Go to John 5. We're going to look at a lot of verses in John real quick. Let's look at some other father-son examples that are just completely destroyed with this stupid false doctrine. John 5, 23. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. So we see the Father again sending the Son. Look at verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Again, the Father sending the Son, not doing His own will. What a lie if oneness is true. What a fraud. What a phony. What an imagination. Look at verse 37. And the Father Himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard His voice at any time, nor seen His shape. Now don't these oneness heretics believe that the soul, you can't see the Father because He's a soul, but if He came in flesh you would see Him. Because this flesh was the Jesus Christ, right? But what did this say? It says that you've never seen His shape. Isn't Jesus Christ supposed to be the shape? Why? They've never seen God the Father. Never. They saw the Son. Go to John chapter 8. Flip over a couple more chapters. Look at verse 16. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I'm not alone. Oh, what? For I am not alone. For I am not alone. Oh, He's one God. He's one person. Sounds like He's alone. But I am the Father that sent me. Go to John. Look at the, uh, Let's keep reading there. Verse 17. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men 
is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Now this to me was the clearest verse. To, to, like It just blew my mind. I was like, it's two people. It's two persons. He's talking about two men, and then he says, I'm one, and my Father's one. What? They're two persons of the Trinity. Go to John chapter 8, verse 25. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Now guess what? This next verse just summarizes these oneness doctrine heretics. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. He's not speaking about himself. He's speaking about the Father. He's saying, hey, the one that sent me, that's the Father. You think, you're think, you th you think I'm talking about myself? No. I'm talking about the Father. Then say Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as the Father hath taught me, I speak these things. So I guess He taught Himself. Ridiculous. Look at verse 42. Jesus saith unto him, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Well, if the Father became the Son, how in the world is that verse true? That he didn't come from himself. Right. The only way that's true is if the Son is an eternal person that's always existed. That's the only way that verse is true. God's not a liar. He's not a deceiver. He's not lying here. I believe the King James Bible. I guess if you get a corrupt version, maybe it says something different. Right. Look at John 12. We'll move to my next point pretty soon. I have, I have just scores and scores of scriptures. There's so many scriptures that just prove this over and over and over and over. It's a joke. It's a fraud. The Trinity is crystal clear in the Bible. Whenever you open up the cake and you look inside, it's three layers. It's manifest. It's obvious. And then when I go back to the Old Testament, oh, it just looks like one cake. Yeah, on the outside, in the, in the Old Covenant... Where it just emphasizes the one God over and over. Yeah, of course. But look at the New Testament. The better covenant. The better testament. That describes God in more detail. It brings to light more things. Jesus Christ is the light. He lightened the world. He lightened the eyes of the Gentiles. He's given us truth. That we can understand all things. Paul said, consider what I say. And the Lord gave the understanding in all things. I don't want to understand half things. I want to understand all things. That's why I'm going to go to the New Testament and I'm going to understand God's three in one. Go to 1 John. Let's, let's just wrap up this point. 1 John chapter 4. Really important point. 1 John 4 verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in Him and He in God. You see, it's super clear. They're testifying the Father sent the Son. Well, I guess they're all liars because the Father just became the Son. He didn't really send them. Just a facade. It's just a fake. It's just a phony. Just like these people who come into our church and just pretend to believe like we do. Pretend to believe all the same things. Pretending to believe the Trinity. Pretending to baptize like we do. Pretending to believe all the same things. It's a facade. It's a fake. It's a phony. It says it sounds like you're angry. Yeah, I'm angry. Yeah, I'm angry. Just like Pastor Anderson was angry. And you know what? I don't want him to be on an island alone. I don't want him to seem like, oh, it's just Pastor Anderson that thinks it's a big deal. Oh, it's just Pastor Anderson that thinks this is righteous. This is an unrighteous thing or false doctrine. No! Even if it's my best friend that believes this junk, kick him out of the church. Amen. Get him out. Yep. I love God's Word more than any of that false doctrine. I'll preach against myself if I have to. If I preach something false, kick me out of the church if I don't convert back to the truth. That's a heretic. A heretic isn't preaching something false wrong, wrong once. It's when you won't get corrected. It's when somebody shows you, hey buddy, you're wrong. Here's your first admonition. Oh, here's your second admonition. See ya. Get out of here. These guys have had hundreds of admonitions. Get out of here. You don't want to believe the Bible. We believe the Bible here. Amen. Go to... Uh, Go to Matthew chapter 10. You know, and isn't it just interesting 
that I asked these guys a few times, like, what do you, what do you think is different? Like, if you start your church, what would you do a little bit different? Would you do the same service of order, or same order of service? Would you have all these things? We talked about a few minor, just really minor things, just non-important you know, important stuff, not a big deal. It wasn't like we were talking against the church or anything negative. We were just kind of, hey, what do you think about this? They never brought this up. Hey, why wouldn't you bring up the God? Oh, I think God's completely different than you do. Well, isn't that a big selling point? Hey, I'm going to buy a plane ticket to come help you start a church, and you're not even going to tell me this huge doctrinal difference, this heresy? Yeah. Why? Because you're pretending. Because right. you're lying. Because right. you don't care about me. You don't care about the fact that I want to go and help you and spend money and take time away from my wife and time away from my kids. Oh, but I'm just going to pretend like I believe like you. I'm just going to pretend. Knowing full well, if I knew that, I would have nothing to do with that. That rank heresy, false doctrine. And every time I get around these people, oh, I'm just working so hard. Oh, I'm working so hard. I'm working 60 and 80 hours a week. I'm working so hard. I'm doing all this work. Turns out it's a lie. Turns out you're just pretending. You're just pretending. Every single time I was around Tyler Baker, he said, man, I'm just working so hard. I'm just working so many hours. And you know what? I believe that. I believe that wholeheartedly. I thought, man, this guy's working so hard. Glory to God, I hope one day I can be like that. I hope one day I can work that hard. I don't think anybody can work that hard. It's all a pretend. It's all fake. It's all a lie. Look at Matthew 10, verse 27. When I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. You're going to tell me that Jesus Christ in the darkness showed you some great, wonderful thing, and you're afraid to preach it? You're afraid to go around and tell people? Oh, I'm so afraid to go around and tell people and tell Pastor Anderson. <laughs> you really think that Pastor Anderson doesn't want to know the truth? Wouldn't believe the truth from God's Word? No, it's because you knew it was wicked. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. You're pretending. And maybe you didn't have those all conscious on your mind, but that's what you were doing. You go around lying about all this junk. I have a lot more. Let's just go on to the second point. Let's go to... Uh, Go to Galatians chapter 3. You know, they said, well, they, they, these guys contacted me like, you're preaching the same thing we did. You know, it was in your heart. Yeah, well, Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Even if I preach something from my heart, it could be wrong. We need to go, always go back to the Bible. Let God be true and every man a liar. I'm not above this book. I'm not going to... You know, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. If what I'm saying doesn't line up with the Bible, believe the Bible every time. And you know what? If I stray from the Bible, and I'm not willing to change, kick me out of the church. Never call me. Have no fellowship with me. Treat me as a publican and a heathen. Why? Because I love God's Word. You know, the Bible says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know, the interesting thing about that verse is it's talking about loving the law. What does that mean? It means when the law applies to you, you want the law to be upheld. You want the law to be executed on yourself, on your wife, on your children, on your brethren, on all those that are close to you, on your best friend. If your best friend apostatizes, guess what? I'm going to choose the law of God, and I'm not going to be offended because I love God's word more. I'm never going to be offended if God's word is executed. I'm never going to be offended if a fornicator gets kicked out of the church, whoever it is. I'm never going to be offended when God's word is taught and preached. But those that don't love God's word, they get offended by God's preaching. When you preach against fornication, who's offended? The fornicators. Why? Because they don't love God's word. Now, of course, we can be convicted. We can feel ashamed of our sin. But guess what? If we love God's word... We won't be offended when it's when it's preached. We won't be offended when it's executed. We won't be offended because I want God's word to be lifted up. I think about it as this. If I wasn't qualified to be a pastor, I never want to be a pastor. Why? Let God's word be elevated. I'm nothing. It's not about me. It's about God's word. I'll just be a soul winner for the rest of my life. But I don't want God's word to you know, be, well, it's not that important. It's not that big a deal. That's not really what it says. That's usually what they do. You say, hey, it says rebuke not an elder. That's not really what it means. 
I can sit there and rail against Pastor Anderson. I can stretch forth my hand against God's anointed and nothing bad's going to happen to me. Well, you can believe that there's no God, but you're still going to go to hell. And guess what? Just because you might not want to believe it, it's because you don't love God's word. You don't love his law, so you're offended. Galatians 3, look at verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ is evidently set forth, crucified among you. What is it saying there? He's questioning their salvation. You know, every time you talk to one of these guys, they're like, do you think I'm saved? Do you think I'm saved? Well, do you think I'm saved? They're like, why would anybody ever question someone's salvation? Guess what? Paul did it in 1 Corinthians 15. He did it in Galatians 3. He's saying, oh man, I'm afraid of you. Maybe you believed in vain if you don't really believe in the resurrection. Hey, if you're believing in work salvation, what are you doing? You're bewitched. It's not something you should, oh, you should never question someone's salvation. Ever. Well, I guess Paul messed up a couple times. Do you think I'm saved? If you're saved, why do you care? You know a question I never ask somebody ever? Do you think I'm saved? Right. I could care less what you think about me. I know I'm right. saved, exactly. for I know whom I believe in, and I, am, I know that I'm able to keep that which I've committed on him against that day. I know I'm trusted in. I know I'm saved. I don't care what you think. <clears throat> what is John, Jonathan that thou art mindful of him anyways? Why do you care what I think? Why are you watching my sermon? Why are you researching me? Why are you making videos about me? Why do you care? Exactly. I'm nothing. I'm a flea. Yeah. Go back to your camp, Saul. Right. Look at Galatians 3.20. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. You know what it destroys? Oneness destroys the first point. It destroys the Father, Son. The second point is it destroys the mediator of Jesus Christ. What's a mediator? A mediator is an unbiased party in the middle between two other parties. Now if God is just one... He can't mediate for himself. You can't be a mediator. Now you could defend yourself like an attorney. If you were an attorney by profession, you could defend yourself as an attorney. But guess what? You can't mediate for yourself because you're not unbiased. You can't say, well, I'll represent myself. Okay, so I guess we'll give him all the money because I'm an unbiased party. No, that's ridiculous. A mediator in and of itself. It says one that mediates. One that mediates between parties at variance. There's two parties. There's a conflict. So someone comes in the middle and settles the, the conflict. That's the mediator. It says he's not the mediator of one, but God is one. Look, God's one party involved. We're the other party involved. Guess who's in the middle? Jesus Christ. Who's God? God the Father. God the Father's at variance with all sinners. He can't let even one sin into heaven. Not even one lie. And guess what? Jesus Christ is the advocate with the Father. It says in 1 Timothy 2, For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There's a mediator there. He can't be a mediator to himself. That's false. Oh, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who? Jesus Christ the righteous. Now why, would you have, why in the world would you need to be advocating to yourself? I mean, if Jesus is the Father, as they suppose, then when we pray to Jesus, why does he then have to also then pray to the Father? Or advocate to the Father. If He is the Father, right. why can't we just go straight to Jesus? And He goes straight back to us. Because He's not the Father. He's advocating in between. Go to uh, Genesis chapter 1 if you would. The Bible says, For this cause He is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So we see Jesus Christ is the mediator of the New Testament. So we see that he destroys the Father and Son. He destroys the mediator. He destroys the advocate, as it were. Third way that he destroys it, destroys the plurality of God. And all the statements that he made that were plural. Yeah. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon earth. Now again, I believe this wholeheartedly that, like I showed you with the cake, the Old Testament focuses on the one, that there's one God. It focuses on the outside of the cake. focuses on all three of them being the one. There's one Lord, there's one God. But occasionally we get a statement that's like, well, it's a tri-layer cake though. Well, he's made in our image. 
And it just kind of leaves a little bit of mystery there. It talks about the sun in different parts in the Old Testament, but it's still a little bit mysterious. But then once you slice it open, you get in the New Testament, it's just crystal clear, there's three. But if this is just one, then this is a lie. Imagine I stepped into this room, and I said, hey, me and myself in here, and this other guy, we start talking. You're like, Who, who's all in there? Oh, it's just me. Just me and my words. That's a lie. I mean, it's just false. If I go in there and I start talking with two different voices, I start doing well. I'm trying to pretend that there's multiple people there. If I'm saying, oh, let us. It's like I'm pretending that there's multiple people when there's not. God's not the pretender. There's really three people before the world began. They're talking to themselves and they say, well, that doesn't make any sense because I'm not three people. So why in the world could I be made in the image of God? Well, imagine me, my father, and my grandfather all standing and talking. And we look at my son and we say, oh man, is he not in the image of us? Now doesn't that make a lot of sense? Oh, I'm just saying what? He looks like us. I'm not saying he looks like three people. That's retarded. That's what they say. Oh, you all think he, that with three people, we look like three people. No. It's just saying we're, he's made in the likeness of God. Go to uh, John chapter 5 if you would. I'll read for you in Matthew 26. It says, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Mark chapter 14 says, Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So you see, Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of what? The power of God. It says in John chapter 5, verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Now, you can't be equal to yourself. It's just literally impossible. You can be yourself, but you can't be equivalent to yourself. There has to be something that's different that's being valued and saying these are equivalent in some way. Maybe in value, in size. It doesn't matter exactly what the context, but you can't be equivalent to yourself. And you know what they want to... They want to talk about the throne. They want to say, oh, there's one in the throne. Go to Revelation 5. We'll look at a couple more verses before we finish. Revelation 5. Really important. It says, and I saw, verse 1, and I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with the seven seals. So we have one person sitting on the throne in this verse. Okay. He has something in his right hand. Now let's skip down to... Uh, Verse 6, and I, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, and in the, midst, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, odors which are the prayers of saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. To God by thy blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So we see these guys, what? They're falling down. They're worshiping. They're singing a song unto the Lamb. Now that's two different things there. So I said this to one of them. I said, well, what would you call those two things? No answer. Guess what? It's two persons. It's super clear. It's super obvious. There's two there. But if it was really one, then it's a lie. Yep. Then he's a pretender. He's pretending. Oh, I'm pretending to be this lamb. But I'm not really the lamb. That's not really who I am. I'm not really the son. It's just me pretending to pretend to myself. And it's just all a charade, it's just a game, and I'm just pretending to play house with myself. That's their God. Their God's a God that's just the pretender. He pretends to be the God of the Bible. He pretends to send his son. He pretends to be the son. He pretends to have a father. He pretends there's the Holy Ghost. I mean, it's just this charade and facade. You see, the cake is just half baked. It just makes no sense. And the Bible says in 2 Peter 3. For this they were willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and you're standing out of the water and in the water. Someone that looks at all this, looks at John 3.16, and they still say, oh, it's oneness. They're willingly ignorant. That's the only answer. 
they're willingly choosing not to believe the clear verses of the Bible. And the Bible says a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Why can I call you a heretic? Because you didn't correct it the first time. You didn't correct it the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. Reject. And you're going to be called a heretic because I'm not ashamed of the Word of God. I'm not ashamed to call somebody a heretic that the Bible calls a heretic. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your Word. Thank you for making it manifest who you are. Thank you, God the Father, for sending the Son to die for the sins of the world. We see the love of a Father for the Son and how much you love us to sacrifice Him so that we could all go to heaven one day. I pray that we would never be caught up in something so foolish and unlearned and half-baked that has no truth in the Scripture. We know that you're true and holy and righteous. You're not a deceiver. You're not a pretender. There's one that's a pretender. That's the Antichrist. That's Satan. I just thank you, Father, for all that you've given us in this church. I pray that we would just continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.